First Space Shuttle Mission, First Orbital Flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia. The First Orbiter, Columbia, launched on April 12, 1981, and returned on April 14, 1981, 54.5 hours later, having orbited the Earth 36 times. The launch occurred on the 20th anniversary of Vostok 1, the first human spaceflight, performed by Yuri Gagarin for the USSR. This was a coincidence rather than a celebration of the anniversary, a technical problem had prevented STS-1 from launching two days earlier, as was planned. If STS-1 had launched in March 1979 as originally scheduled, we'd have been launched about half-trained, Young said. During the original planning stages for the early space shuttle missions, NASA management under the Carter administration felt a need to undertake initial tests of the system prior to the first orbital flight. NASA further suggested that STS-1, instead of being an orbital flight, be used to test the return to launch site abort scenario. This involved an abort being called in the first few moments after launch, and using its main engines, once the SRBs had been jettisoned, to power it back to the launch site. The first launch of the space shuttle occurred on April 12, 1981, exactly 20 years after the first manned spaceflight, when the orbiter Columbia lifted off from Pad A, Launch Complex 39, at the Kennedy Space Center. The launch took place at 12 hours 0 minutes and 4 seconds coordinated universal time. A launch attempt two days earlier was scrubbed because Columbia's four primary general-purpose IBM system, four Pi computers failed to provide correct timing to the backup flight system when the GPCs were scheduled to transition from vehicle checkout to flight configuration mode. Not only was this the first launch of the space shuttle, but it marked the first time that solid fuel rockets were used for a NASA crewed launch. STS-1 was also the first U.S. crewed space vehicle launched without an uncrewed powered test flight. The STS-1 orbiter, Columbia, also holds the record for the amount of time spent in the orbiter processing facility before launch 610 days, the time needed for the replacement of many of its heat shield tiles. The NASA mission objective for the maiden flight was to accomplish a safe ascent into orbit and return to Earth for a safe landing of orbiter and crew. The only payload carried on the mission was a development flight instrumentation package, which contains sensors and measuring devices to record the orbiter's performance and the stresses that occurred during launch, ascent, orbital flight, descent and landing. All 113 flight test objectives were accomplished, and the orbiter's spaceworthiness was verified. During the final T-9 minute holding period, launch director George Page read a message of good wishes to the crew from President Ronald Reagan, ending with, John, we can't do more from the launch team than say, we wish you an awful lot of luck. We are with you 1000% and we are awful proud to have been a part of it. Good luck gentlemen. The stack's combined northwards translation and climb above the launch tower's lightning rod were readily apparent to Young. After clearing the tower the stack began a right roll to a launch azimuth of 067 degree true, and pitched to a heads down attitude. Simultaneously control was passed from the launch team in Florida to flight director Neil Hutchinson's silver team in flight control room 1 in Texas with astronaut Dan Brandenstein as their Capcom. Columbia's main engines were throttled down to 65% thrust to transit the region of max Q, the point during ascent when the shuttle undergoes maximum aerodynamic stress. Overall Young commented that there was a lot less vibration and noise during launch than they had expected. President Ronald Reagan had originally intended to visit the Mission Control Center during the mission, but at the time was still recovering from an assassination attempt which had taken place two weeks before the launch. In Houston, the Crimson team headed by their flight director Don Putty came on duty in FCR-1 for the mission's final shift. Young again took manual control for the remainder of the flight as they went subsonic approaching the heading alignment circle. Roughly 70 anomalies were observed during and after the flight, owing to the many components and systems that could not otherwise be adequately tested. Similar to the first Saturn V launch in 1967, engineers underestimated the amount of noise and vibration produced by the space shuttle. Pilot Crippen reported that, throughout the first stage of the launch up to SRB separation, he saw white stuff coming off the external tank and splattering the windows, which was probably the white paint covering the external tank's thermal foam. Due to the top secret nature of the satellite, only a small number of NASA personnel were aware of this, and they had arranged for the photography prior to the launch as a precaution to make sure no damage had been done to the thermal tiles on the underside of the orbiter as there had never been a flight of a crewed spacecraft before where the heat shield was exposed to the vacuum of space for the entire duration of the mission. Aligning the shuttle's low Earth orbit with the KH-11's polar orbit was a somewhat tricky move, and launch on April 12th was scheduled for a few minutes after the launch window opened, due to the need to get the KH-11 into correct orientation for imaging the shuttle. 
Such damage would have made a controlled descent impossible, with John Young later admitting that had the crew known about this, they would have flown the shuttle up to a safe altitude and ejected, causing Columbia to be lost on the first flight. After some modifications to the shuttle and to the launch and re-entry procedures, Columbia flew the next four shuttle missions. The ultimate launch date of STS-1 fell on the 20th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's Vostok 1, the first spaceflight to carry a human crew. In a tribute to the 25th anniversary of the first flight of Space Shuttle, Firing Room 1 in the Launch Control Center at Kennedy Space Center, which launched STS-1 was renamed the Young Crippen Firing Room. NASA described the mission as the boldest test flight in history. To reduce the shuttle's overall weight, all flights from STS-3 onward used an unpainted tank. The song, Countdown, by Rush, from the 1982 album Signals, was written about STS-1 in the inaugural flight of Columbia. The footage of the launch was commonly played on MTV throughout the 1980s and 1990s, and was the first thing shown on the channel, along with footage of Neil Armstrong on the moon and the launch of Apollo 11. IMAX cameras filmed the launch, landing, and mission control during the flight, for a documentary film entitled Hail Columbia, which debuted in 1982 and later became available on DVD. The title of the film comes from the pre-1930s unofficial American national anthem, Hail, Columbia. In 2006, Collateral Damage, the twelfth episode of the ninth season of the long-running Canadian-American military science fiction television show Stargate SG-1, a childhood flashback shows that the character Lt. Col. Cameron Mitchell witnessed the launch with his father live on television at the age of 10, one of the events that led to him becoming a United States Air Force pilot. NASA began a tradition of playing music to astronauts during the Project Gemini, and first used music to wake up a flight crew during Apollo 15. The incident did not delay the launch of STS-1 less than a month later, but pilot Robert Crippen gave an on-orbit tribute to Bjornstad and Cole.